And then it asks, should Moltes be teaching too? That's hilarious. And that you know he doesn't teach. Cool. Last chance for questions or people to jump in before I get started and jump into full screen PowerPoint mode. What was that? Good morning, Winfield. I see you. Okay. You're not supposed to present. You don't need to do that. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Yeah, is it you could stop presenting? Rubacaba. <laughs> cool. All right. So I'm pulling the PowerPoint up. Buckle up, and we will get away. All right, if everybody, uh, Nieto, you included, could just put your uh, screens on mute for right now so I don't have to hear you drinking and eating your freaking hash browns. That'd be great. Okay, my friend. As much as I love hearing you eat, it's, it sounds delicious. <laughs> All right. Cool. Mute. Everybody's muted. All right. Damn, yet though, just grow it on the freaking screen. All right, so what I have, guys, if you can pull up your uh, notes for today, 8.5, JFK and LBJ's Cold War, Cuba, Vietnam, and the New Left. What I want you to do is I want you to take just three minutes on your own quickly, uh, and I want you to go ahead and read JFK's, just a quick short excerpt from JFK's first, his only, uh, inaugural address. Uh, and I want you to pull into the, the chat bar function. Uh, what are some of the pledges and promises that Kennedy makes in his inaugural address? What are the, some of the things that he promises to the rest of the world and to America as a whole? So go ahead and take about three minutes and just skim through it and identify in the chat function uh, as you write on your own notes some of the pledges and promises made in JFK's inaugural. Three minutes, I'll start the timer right now. So as you guys identify some of those pledges and promises, go ahead and just put them in the chat bar so we can take a look at what you guys are coming up with. I like that. Thank you, Nanette. Good point.
Thanks, Cruzy. Like that. Daniel, good point. Brian, fantastic point as usual. No tyranny. All right. This much we pledge as more. Focus on that third paragraph. Let every nation know. All right. What are we promising to the rest of the world specifically? All right, so that's your time. Uh, there's a couple things I want to point out to you guys uh, as I read this document with you. Uh, the first is, is that, that second paragraph, the first line. It says, we dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution, meaning it's our job still in 1960 as he gets elected to maintain the values and the principles of the American Revolution in the first place, of self-determination is a big one for Kennedy, of, of those countries around the world uh, allowing people to determine for themselves the type of government that they want to hold. Um, a couple other lines that really stand out to me. Uh, the famous line, obviously, is in the third paragraph. Let every nation know, every country in the world, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we, we being America, we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. So I think what this says is, is whatever it takes, we're going to do that to contain communism. We're going to step up to the plate. We're going to pay, pay any cost. We're going to do what we have to do to ensure that uh, communism is not an option for countries around the world. Daniel, really good point. Survival of democracy in the world. Uh, Brian's bored. Brian, you can go back to bed, dude. It's fine. We don't need you. Um, so, uh, it's important that we look at Kennedy's first inaugural address in the broader context of the Cold War in that we've just finished an era of brinksmanship with Eisenhower, uh, of, of a huge increase in the amount of, of weapons that the United States and the Soviet Union has, this arms race. Um, so Kennedy takes, takes the presidency at really a weird time in the Cold War. Things are, are less tense because of brinksmanship uh, but yet we have the capacity to increase tension very quickly because of the mass amounts of destructive weapons that both sides of the Cold War have by 1960. The line that I think really stands out to me uh, in 1960 is the very, very first line, right? For man holds in his mortal hands the power, the power to abolish all forms of human poverty. So we could if we wanted to end human poverty, but we also have the power to abolish all forms of human life. So it's a really strange time domestically in the US and overseas as we have such wealth and such capacity for progress, but we also have the ability as humans to end the world as we know it because of atomic weapons and the like. So that's, that's kind of like the context for how we get here. Um, real quick, if somebody could uh, turn their mute off and just let me know if you guys can see the PowerPoint right now uh, in full screen mode. Yes, yes, no, yes. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. All right, so let's go ahead and get cracking then. Uh, so today we're going to talk about one of the most culturally, politically, economically, and socially divisive topics uh, in American history. It's something that I find very fascinating myself, uh, and that is the Vietnam War. So we're, gonna, we're not gonna talk just about the Vietnam War. We're gonna talk about the Vietnam War in the broader context of Kennedy and LBJ's Cold War. Uh, but the Vietnam War will play primary focus on our conversation for the rest of today. Uh, your prompt is as follows. I would have Kevin Winfield read it, but we don't really need to hear his voice right now. Uh, evaluate the effects of Vietnam on American culture, American society, and American politics. So what I'm gonna do after this lecture is I'm gonna pop up uh, this prompt on Google Classroom uh, just to give you guys a chance to write a response to it, just a quick thesis statement uh, to ensure that I've done my job, you've done your job, and we're all clear on how Vietnam impa impacts these three elements of society. So as we begin, as we begin, uh, like I just mentioned in our do now, we, Kennedy takes the presidency after Eisenhower, and Eisenhower's response was basically brinksmanship we're going to stand here on the edge and either we're going to do nothing 
or we're going to atomic bomb you into the sixth century. So Eisenhower doesn't really, there's no, remember, there's no, no middle ground, right? We're going to threaten to atomic bomb you to get our way. And if that doesn't work, then we'll just atomic bomb you and we'll go from there. So Kennedy's going to shift the Cold War policy from Eisenhower's uh, mutually assured destruction, meaning you bomb us, we bomb you, the world's done, to what Kennedy calls flexible response. Uh, so it's important as we think about the Cold War as a long scope that we're able to identify what each president approaches the Cold War with and what each president does to back that. Uh, so Eisenhower, brinksmanship, atomic bombs, he threatens China to stop expansion, uh, and he threatens the USSR with the Suez Canal crisis uh, to get his way. Kennedy's going to be a little more flexible in his response, hence the title, Flexible Response. Um, so this way, as the Cold War adapts, as the Cold War evolves, so too does the U.S. ability to respond to it. Uh, what Kennedy's going to do to back this uh, is he's going to increase our nuclear arsenal um, with a whole bunch of more missiles and a whole bunch of more submarines. It's a new uh, technological advancement of the Cold War. Uh, submarines that can deliver atomic weapons uh, to create what we call first strike capability so that we don't need to wait to be attacked to do the attacking. Uh, unlike Eisenhower, who decreased the size of the Army and decreased the size of the Air Force to cut costs, Kennedy's going to increase the Army and the Air Force. Uh, and Kennedy's going to be really responsible for expanding uh, kind of the covert operations that we'll see uh, throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The idea of using the military in a, in a more sneaky, behind-the-scenes, less obvious way. Uh, and Kennedy creates the Green Berets, which is still to this day considered one of the elite groups of uh, military units that uh, can do things like, for example, kill Osama bin Laden and do all kinds of sneaky stuff like that. Uh, so JFK is convinced as he takes the office that the USSR has has way more missiles, uh, that, that we're falling behind in the arms race, probably because we had just fallen behind in the space race. Uh, but in reality, looking back at it from history, the US has far more planes uh, far more atomic warheads, uh, more ability to deliver weapons than the Soviet Union does. But it's this fear that they're passing us by, which is going to fuel a lot of what happens in the 1960s. Uh, but it's important that I note that Kennedy's not just worried about the Cold War militarily. Uh, he's also worried about the Cold War kind of in a similar way to what we see with the Marshall Plan, but on a smaller scale. Uh, to combat communism in underdeveloped countries, those countries that we refer to in the Cold War as the third world, right? they're not aligned with the US, they're not aligned with the USSR, they're underdeveloped, they're likely former colonies uh, from the imperialist phase. Uh, JFK is gonna create two really important organizations. Uh, the Peace Corps, uh, which is going to send young people largely uh, to underdeveloped countries to help build infrastructure and dig wells for water and pave roads and start to spread goodwill. Uh, and then hopefully with it spread capitalism. Uh, and he's also going to create the Alliance for Progress of, of underdeveloped countries working together to build capital, to build financial alignment and the like. Now, JFK's first like, real issue of the Cold War of his 1960s is going to come in Berlin. Uh, now, as you guys know, uh, Germany is divided between East and West. Uh, and Berlin, the capital of Germany, which is in East Germany, is also going to be divided between East and West. Now, Nikita Khrushchev, who at, by this point is in charge of the Soviet Union, he's upset. He's angry um, because for the previous five, seven, 10, 15 years, skilled workers who are in East Berlin are leaving East Berlin to go to West Berlin because there's more opportunities for skilled work. Now, if you think about it, in a, in a communist system in which everybody is equal, everybody's the same, we don't really see an emphasis on skilled labor. It devalues skilled labor. So we shouldn't be surprised then that these skilled laborers, those that have technological skills and advancements, uh, are wanting to go somewhere in which their skills might get them a higher standard of living, a better life. Now, Khrushchev is upset that all these workers are leaving East Germany to go to West Berlin. Uh, and the USSR threatens to remove all U.S. influence from West Berlin, to seize West Berlin, to take West Berlin for the USSR. Um, but in realizing that that would probably cause a, a third world war potentially, and at the very least another instance of the Berlin airlift, what they do instead is they build a wall. They build a wall. And this wall is going to be called the Berlin Wall. It's built uh, in 1961 very, very quickly. It's going to provide kind of the visual 
representation of the Iron Curtain ideology that we read about from Churchill earlier in the 1940s and 50s. Now this Berlin Wall is gonna really become the symbolic gesture of the Cold War as, as East and West are divided by a wall. Uh, and JFK kind of takes a lot of, of flack, takes a lot of uh, criticism for allowing this wall to be built and not really doing anything about it. All right, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, what we see is, and I want to stress this, is here's Berlin. Here's Berlin. And as you can see, the wall is built around West Berlin to keep all influence, all exodus, all migration out of West Berlin. Right? Um, it, it allows East Berlin, people who live in East Berlin, they have free access to go to the rest of East Germany. It's just that we don't want, we, Khrushchev doesn't want anybody from uh, outside West Berlin in the rest of East Germany able to go there and, and live an American style life. So this wall is put up around West Berlin. It's not just dividing West and East Berlin, it's also dividing West Berlin from the rest of East Germany. Uh, and it is patrolled militarily by uh, the Soviet Union forces, keeping all Western ideas kind of contained, if you will, uh, in West Berlin. All right, JFK make, goes and makes a speech in Berlin in 1963, a very famous speech in which he says, ich bin ein Berliner, uh, meaning, hoping to mean that we are all Berlin, trying to argue to the West Berliners to stand strong, that the Western world is with them. But other than that, his response is kind of to just let this happen. All right, so Kennedy, if you want to like, uh, look at like a wins and losses kind of argument. We're going to give Kennedy a loss here uh, because the Berlin Wall is put up on his watch and he allows West Berlin to kind of be isolated from the rest of the world because of the Berlin Wall. Now, his second issue, his second uh, loss, if you will, is going to happen with the Bay of Pigs, which is a much, much, much bigger issue. Now, Cuba, as you guys should know, is not very far off the coast of Florida in the southeastern United States, the small islands. Fidel Castro uh, and his revolutionary movement is going to take over Cuba in 1959 and almost immediately uh, put in place a communist system and quickly create a, a formal alliance with the Soviet Union. So now we have, for the first time, uh, containment failing in the Western Hemisphere. Now we talked about the loss of China. We talked about uh, right after the war, after World War II, the loss to, of North Korea to the Soviet influence, the loss of Eastern Europe to Soviet influence. We tried really hard as a country to ensure that Greece and Turkey don't fall to communism via the Truman Doctrine. We tried really hard to ensure that, that Western Europe doesn't fall to communism via the Marshall Plan. Uh, we tried really hard to make sure the Middle East doesn't fall to communism via the Eisenhower Doctrine. But now... Now we have a small island right off the coast of the United States that has fallen to communism in Cuba. Bad thing, right? It's a, it's a, a foreboding sense of dread for America that communism is right there at America's doorstep. So Fidel Castro is the individual in charge of Cuba. Uh, the Eisenhower administration, so right at the tail end of his presidency, as we know, Kennedy gets elected in 1960. So here at the very end of Eisenhower's administration, uh, the Eisenhower administration begins training Cuban exiles, meaning people who fled Cuba when Castro took over, who fled to America. Uh, the Eisenhower administration and the CIA, again, an example of the U.S. using covert movements, sneaky movements, has been training these exiles to go back to Cuba with U.S. support, to invade the island of Cuba with U.S. support. They're ex-Cubans, well, they're still Cubans, but ex-residents of Cuba. Uh, and use this, this invasion to create a revolution of the people and overthrow Fidel Castro. So Eisenhower leaves the White House, and the CIA then comes to JFK after he's elected and says, hey, there was this plan. We weren't quite ready to execute it yet. We're ready to execute it now. I think it's, we think it's important that you authorize this you allow the CIA to initiate what becomes known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. And it's called that because they're gonna invade in what's called the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. So the CIA is going to back these, these Cuban refugees basically who've left Cuba as they go back and try to inspire a revolution of the Cuban people to overthrow Castro and get rid of communism in Cuba. Now, opinion, this sounds like a really bad idea. Uh, to send these people back without any formal backing of the United States government, 
because if the United States government backed it formally, that might look like an act of war against the Soviet Union. So it seems like a bad idea at the time, and then it goes really, really, really poorly. Now, JFK, when he's running for president, is going to blame the Republicans. Right? Both sides have been blaming each other. Right? Truman lost China. Truman couldn't end the Korean War. Here's JFK blaming Republicans for allowing a communist satellite to arise on our very doorstep. So because he blames Republicans for doing this, he feels like he has to do something about it now that he's president. Uh, and that is what gives us this Bay of Pigs invasion. So it's April of 1961, just into Kennedy's presidency. He, of course, is inaugurated in January, three and a half, four months later. Um, CIA train Cuban exiles. They invade. They're supposed to invade and overthrow Castro's Cuba. Um, the U.S. Uh, planes flown, of course, by Cuban refugees as well. So the U.S. military is not involved. Um, but U.S. planes are going to be used. Uh, 1,400 soldiers who are Cuban uh, former refugees are going to invade Cuba. Uh, it ends up being a full-on, full-on disaster. Uh, it is botched. 118 of these people are killed. Uh, 1,200 of the others are taken uh, prisoners. As you can see, that means that almost the entire invading force out of 1,400, if you add 1,202 plus 118, not good. Um, almost the entire invading force is captured by the Cuban officials. Uh, the response from Cuba is basically, thank you, Kennedy. You've done it. You've managed to make our, our weak revolution much stronger because now all of Cuba has a common enemy and saying, look what the United States, these capitalist pigs are trying to do in telling us how to run our country. Um, che Guevara is a, a famous revolutionary who works hand in hand, side by side with Fidel Castro. Uh, and he says, as you see in the quote on the slide, before the invasion, the revolution was weak. Now it's stronger than ever. Bay of Pigs full foreign policy disaster. Uh, even a year later, uh, the US still hasn't given up on getting rid of communism this close to the United States borders. Uh, in Operation Mongoose, it's called, uh, the CIA launches a very covert operation to overthrow Castro. Uh, there's a series of other attempts to overthrow Castro over the years, uh, and all of them fail miserably. So uh, as you're following along in your notes, uh, we can see that for question one, how did Kennedy's response to the Cold War differ from Eisenhower? It's this idea of flexible response, which is different. But it's similar in that both presidents, all presidents of the Cold War, really stressed the idea of containment, of not letting communism spread from where it is. Uh, Berlin crisis slash Berlin Wall, a loss. Uh, Bay of Pigs, a full-on disaster. And that's what leads us to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Cuban Missile Crisis. So what I'll do uh, is I'll pause for a second I'll pause for a second uh, and ensure that there are no questions in the chat. I have 23 comments there, so give me a second. Uh, yep, Kevin, you should have read the prompt. I agree. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Make sure that we're all good here. Uh, why is it called Bay of Pigs? Uh, that's just what uh, the bay, the area is called uh, in Cuba. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Shmuley. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, any other questions? Uh, currently, from where we are on Kennedy's early struggles with the Cold War. All right, I think we're good then. And back to the PowerPoint, I go. So this leads us to a place in which, if you look at this world from the Cuban standpoint and from the Soviet Union standpoint, they look at this and say, we have to protect Cuba because the U.S. is intent on overthrowing communism in Cuba. So from their perspective, it makes sense that they would want to make sure that Cuba is protected. From the U.S. perspective, you can see that the U.S. really is unhappy that there is a communist nation this close to the United States. So both sides are going to take actions regarding just Cuba. As you can see in this map in the bottom right corner of this slide, Cuba is incredibly close to the southern tip of Florida. Uh, it's within less than 150 miles of Miami. Uh, it's quite close uh, boat-wise to places like New Orleans, Houston, Texas, Washington, D.C. Uh, so the whole southeastern part of the United States is close to Cuba. So both sides look at Cuba as incredibly valuable. Uh, the U.S. with the Bay of Pigs, uh, which backfires badly, basically tells the Soviet Union, 
we're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that communism does not survive here. And therefore, the uh, Soviet Union is going to say the same thing. We're going to do everything we have to do to ensure communism does survive in Cuba. Uh, so as the U.S. Anti antagonizes Cuba, as the U.S., uh, the Bay of Pigs, the attempts to kill Castro, etc., they antagonize Cuba, that only makes the Cubans more bold in their relationship with the Soviet Union, logically speaking, right? very logically speaking. So in this emboldened relationship, uh, as, as the Cubans and the Soviets look to each other as, as new besties, uh, the Soviet Union is going to start providing the Cubans with military equipment. Uh, the Castro Guevara revolution is, is, it's a very poor country. Uh, they don't have a lot of industrialization. Uh, they were obviously used by the United States for the last 60 years, uh, for sugar plantations, uh, post Spanish American war. So the Cubans don't have a ton of military equipment until the Soviets begin sending it in great numbers. All right. That part's not particularly offensive to the United States. What becomes more offensive is when the Soviet Union actually starts placing nuclear missiles in Cuba. Now they're called medium range nuclear missiles. But if you look at the PowerPoint picture in the bottom right corner there, it has this, the, the shaded circle shows the limit of Soviet medium range missiles. So from Cuba, if these missiles became functional, uh, the Cubans could launch a missile that would hit uh, Washington DC, that would hit Miami, that could hit New Orleans, that could hit Houston. Uh, there are missiles enough there to kill millions of people in the United States, and it's that close to the U.S. Now, US, the U.S. is flying spy planes uh, over Cuba while all this is happening, and they uncover these missile sites. Uh, the spy planes are able to take pictures, as you see here in this top right corner. This is a picture taken from a spy plane, uh, a U-2 spy plane uh, that demonstrates to the U.S. government what's happening in Cuba as these missiles are being set up. Um, and... The U.S. is faced with a really challenging decision, right? What do we do? Do we allow nuclear weapons to just be placed there uh, at the doorstep of the United States? Do we bomb Cuba so that these missiles can't be built? Do we declare war on Cuba? Do we invade Cuba? What do we do? Uh, so Kennedy's put in a really weird place in which he's already struggled to, to, to handle the Berlin crisis and the Bay of Pigs. Uh, his action here is actually quite, quite smart. Uh, he orders a quarantine funny enough for today's conversation, uh, a quarantine, which is a naval blockade in international waters. What he does is he sends you the U.S. Navy and surrounds Cuba and says, basically, nothing's getting in and nothing's getting out. We're not going to bomb you. We're not going to attack you, but we're going to stop all commerce coming in and out of Cuba. He addresses the nation in this situation. He lets the, the, the country know, like, hey, Boats are currently going to Cuba from the Soviet Union, and if we allow those boats through, then Cuba will have uh, nuclear weapons that can attack the United States. Uh, the United States kind of sort of panics. Uh, it is here that uh, schools begin doing nuclear bomb drills, which I would have you do uh, if we were in school right now as a fun activity, in which kids are, are hiding under their desks as if it was an earthquake drill because that is a solution to nuclear bombs because our desks are so sturdy that it stops radiation. Safety first. Uh, and this actually is, I would argue, the closest the world comes to nuclear war. Uh, this is the closest. This is the tensest. This is the point at which the U.S. and the Soviet Union come closer than they've ever come or ever come since uh, to actually engaging in nuclear all-out warfare. What happens instead is both sides a little bit come to their senses and they uh, begin negotiations. Uh, the Soviet Union agrees to remove nuclear weapons from Cuba. The Soviet Union agrees, you're right, maybe this is too much, it's too close. Uh, we don't want World War III, you don't want World War III. If you promise not to mess with Cuba anymore, and if you do mess with Cuba again, then we'll have World War III, then we'll take our nuclear missiles out. And they do, right? So on the surface, this is a huge win for Kennedy. Kennedy stands up to Khrushchev. It looks as if Khrushchev backs down, props to Kennedy. Uh, behind closed doors, uh, in secret, the U.S. promises to remove its missiles from Turkey and Italy, which are both very close to the Soviet Union. So what we end up seeing is both sides back down. The Soviet Union backs down in public. The U.S. backs down in private, allowing Kennedy to, to kind of take a, a victory lap and say, look what I did. Uh, what comes out of this is just as important. 
it comes out of this is just as important uh, as this. Both sides agree to put a nuclear hotline. So basically a direct phone line from the White House uh, to the capital of the Soviet Union so that as these tensions blow up again, or if they were to blow up again, both sides can communicate directly with each other instead of trying to go through intermediaries and worrying that things get lost in translation figuratively and literally. Um, so this actually ends up, once both sides agree, uh, reducing Cold War tensions, which allows uh, Kennedy to have a pretty mellow rest of his, rest of his Cold War uh, on communism. Cool. So I'm gonna pause here for a second as well. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments uh, in terms of Kennedy before we jump into Vietnam. Anybody, anybody? Kevin, you look beautiful. I see you. Look at you. I wouldn't feel that a boy. All right, all right, all right, all right. Anybody else? Anybody else? We're all good. Oh, who's speaking? All right, if there's no comments or questions, then I'll jump into Vietnam. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, Sandra, I'll be happy to. Uh, good question. So if we, the quarantine situation is basically Kennedy's response, uh, which takes a nice middle ground uh, between all-out attack of Cuba, but also let missiles be installed in Cuba. So with the quarantine, what the U.S. does is we use the Navy to basically create a blockade. Right. Uh, if you think about quarantine in terms of like the coronavirus, right, that, that people aren't allowed out in public. Same thing, but with Cuba. So we're not going to allow anything from Cuba out. We're not going to let anything from the Soviet Union in. We know currently at that time uh, that 19 boats, 19 boats from the Soviet Union are going to arrive in Cuba any day. The U.S. sends these our Navy out to stop those boats. Which is why if anything were to happen between those two sides, it could have ignited World War III. Uh, but the quarantine is meant basically to buy time uh, while he negotiates with Khrushchev behind closed doors to figure out what both sides can do to back down. So the quarantine is it's good to think about as the best example of a flexible response, since his policy is called flexible response, in that he doesn't go all the way to like brinksmanship like Eisenhower would have and say basically, I'm going to bomb you if you don't do, say what I say, do what I say. Uh, but he also doesn't go uh, soft the whole way and say, sure, just put the missiles in and we'll negotiate later. So quarantine is a good example of, of the flexible response that characterizes Kennedy's approach to the Cold War. Does that help? Got you. Got you, got you. Uh, happy to help. Keep, guys, by all means, I, I, if you're confused, keep those questions coming because that's the only way this is going to work for everybody. Dope. See, Mon. Yeah, you tell him. Yeah, Nieto's got his coffee now. What's up, my man? Dope. Nieto, are you done with breakfast yet? He's on mute, but speaking. Cool. So let's transition then to Vietnam. Vietnam of all places. All places. So Vietnam uh, is an interesting situation. Vietnam is in Southeast Asia. Uh, it is called, before this time period, it's called French Indochina because it is a colony of the French for, for many, many years. Now, the Vietnamese, I want to I emphasize this because it's going to kind of help make the war make a little more sense. The Vietnamese people have been fighting for their freedom for centuries, centuries. Uh, from the year 1400 all the way to the year 1800, we see a struggle between Vietnam and China as China is trying to expand their influence. Uh, into Southeast Asia. So this idea of the Vietnamese fighting for their freedom is not a new one. Uh, even before this, the Vietnamese had struggled against Mongol invasions. Uh, so for literally hundreds of years, the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese people have been fighting for their own independence. They want a Vietnam for the Vietnamese, something that we can understand uh, very, very fully. Uh, in 1858, the French conquer Vietnam as part of that broader uh, world history move towards imperialism and colonization. It's in this same context that we see uh, the scramble for Africa, uh, England uh, and India and Egypt. Uh, in about 30, 40 years, the U.S. started to expand to places like Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines, Guam, etc. So that whole second half of the 1800s and first 15 years of the 1900s, pre-World War I, uh, as we know in this time period of imperialism and colonization, 
the Vietnamese fall victim to French colonization. By 1893, uh, the French are going to colonize the modern-day countries of Vietnam, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia into one big colony called French Indochina. French Indochina. Now, 1930, so back during the Great Depression, uh, about 13 years after the Bolshevik, 15 years after the Bolshevik Revolution in the Soviet Union, a very important individual by the name of Ho Chi Minh, or Uncle Ho, as he's often called uh, in Vietnamese. We all have an uncle just like that. Uh, Ho Chi Minh is going to form the Vietnamese Communist Party. Uh, and, and the real aim of the Vietnamese Communist Party is simply to overthrow uh, the French and to ensure that Vietnam can be united as Vietnam as an independent country. Now, during World War II, uh, the Japanese are going to take over Vietnam, uh, like they take over much of the Pacific, uh, pre-U.S. involvement, pre-island hopping, uh, pre-Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, but the Japanese take over Vietnam as part of their huge expansionism into the South and East Pacific. Uh, after Vietnam, they're going to take over Laos, take over Cambodia, take over the Philippines, etc. cetera. Uh, but after the war, it's key. After the war, uh, the world goes through a, a phase of decolonization, right? India is given their freedom. Uh, the U.S. gives independence to the Philippines. Uh, a bunch of countries become decolonized, but the French refuse to decolonize Vietnam. The French refuse to decolonize Vietnam. France comes back. They reoccupy southern Vietnam um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, reason one, the French have their pride wounded from, from World War II. Uh, the, Fran the French economy is ruined from World War II. The French don't understand that, that – the French seem to not understand that they can have a, a, a functioning economy without colonies. Uh, so as the U.S. is kind of decolonizing and the British are decolonizing, the French are recolonizing places like Vietnam, which is going to backfire for the French spectacularly. Uh, France reoccupies Southern Vietnam. Uh, Ho Chi Minh and what's called the Viet Minh, uh, his movement – they're going to take over northern Vietnam. So right after World War II, Vietnam is going to be split into North Vietnam and South Vietnam, with North Vietnam held by Ho Chi Minh and the communists, and South Vietnam held by the French. Uh, Ho Chi Minh and the northern Vietnamese, they're going to declare independence. Uh, Ho Chi Minh is going to write much of the Declaration of Independence uh, with very clear inspiration from the U.S. Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson's ideals of self-determination and equality for all. He's going to really hope that the U.S. honors this because he's so inspired by the U.S. movement for, for independence. Now, the U.S. does not honor this. The U.S. instead is going to start backing the French in this thing uh, because uh, the U.S. is more worried at this point about communism above all other concerns. Um, the Vietnam War begins before the U.S. is even involved between the French and Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese. The U.S. is going to support France, not because France is the good guys, not because we like the Southern Vietnamese, not because of any of that, but simply because they are fighting to stop the spread of communism. So 1945 really begins the Vietnam War for the Vietnamese. The U.S. is still not involved at this time. Um, I'm going to take a minute to make sure that I have a couple questions. Kevin, you got to go to the bathroom, bro? That's, you can just take the computer with you. Turn the computer off. Turn the camera off and you're good. All right. Who's making noise? I'm going to mute you. Uh, I do want to give a quick uh, set of props to you all since there's 56 of you here and out of the 70 that are in A-Push on the first day of, of quarantine. So. Badass. Badass. Bruh. Bruh. Shut up. <laughs> Jesus. Those are your friends, bro. All right. So let me get back into Vietnam then. So if you take the whole broad spectrum of containment, right? Containment in Western Europe, containment in Greece and Turkey, containment in China, containment in Korea. Containment ends up being a really, really tough test in Vietnam. A couple of reasons. Uh, reason one, uh, Ho Chi Minh is incredibly popular. He's the leader of the communist movement in Vietnam. 
uh, and he's a, a communist revolutionary who's from Vietnam. He's educated in French schools during the French Empire, but he is passionate about a Vietnam for Vietnam, and he's incredibly, incredibly popular. Uh, he's going to run the northern Vietnamese country uh, with intentions on uniting all of Vietnam, north and south, under communism. He's very popular in North Vietnam. Very, very, very popular. Uh, and by 1961, right as Kennedy takes the White House, he's going to become increasingly popular in South Vietnam as well. As the Vietnamese people aren't necessarily pro-communist, they're just pro-independence. They're pro-Vietnam. They're pro no more wars with other countries. We want to just have our own country. And they often look to Ho Chi Minh and communism as the way to do that. Now, the U.S., in this broader context of the Cold War, like we do everywhere else, uh, is going to aid a man uh, who's in charge of South Vietnam named No Din Diem. No Din Diem. Now, No Din Diem is terrible. He is atrocious. He is an awful leader. He's a worse human. He is a Catholic who is in charge of a largely Buddhist country. He's going to put restrictions on Buddhism, which is going to lead to Buddhist monks beginning to burn themselves in the streets to immolate themselves to death. Um, he is really 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 unpopular and terrible and the u.s is going to after the french have given up on this fight the u.s is going to step in and be and start giving a ton of support to south vietnam via no din diem simply because he's not communist right we look at the same thing happening in iran with the shah of iran the same thing happening in guatemala the same thing happening across the board the u.s is consistently aiding terrible regimes Regimes that stand with the U.S. on no values simply because they're not communist. Now, by 1963, No Din Diem has lost control of South Vietnam. Uh, and JFK gives the, the okay for a military coup to overthrow Diem. Uh, the military coup overthrows Diem. They kill Diem. They kill his brother. Uh, and now South Vietnam is in flux. It's a hot mess. We don't really know who's in charge. The military's in charge. These generals are in charge. Uh, we don't know what's going on. And then JFK dies as well. So, hey, it's a hot mess. But keep in mind JFK's argument. He says, strongly in our minds is what happened in China at the end of World War II. All right? We don't, we don't want, basically, we saw what happened with the Truman and his popularity. Popularity. Credibility. When China fell to communism and Kennedy says, we don't want that to happen to us. So after the, le the lesson that's learned from Truman losing China is that every president gets blamed for allowing communism to spread. So therefore, don't let communism spread. Now, reasonable lesson learned. Unfortunately, what this means is the U.S. gets involved in a bunch of, of small conflicts that become big conflicts simply because the U.S. does not want to be, each president doesn't want to be the president to let blank fall. To let blank fall fall cool so i have a cartoon uh, i'm going to give you a minute to take a look at it to analyze it uh for its context and its point of view uh also the timer for about 90 seconds i want you to actually give me some some feedback some comments uh in the feed section let's take a look at what you guys see and then we'll talk about lbj taking over in vietnam uh with a really good quote uh right after the cartoon so take about 90 seconds to dive into this cartoon while I set the timer. One minute and 30 seconds. Go for it, guys. Good job, Rochelle. Yeah, Sandra, exactly. No Din gets support from the US because he wasn't communist. Brenda, I don't know if LBJ does nothing to stop the spread or if he's considering what to do looking at his predecessors. But I see your point. Yeah, Sarai, good point. That he's taking the presidency and he's like, look, I've, I've watched Truman and Eisenhower and JFK. Look at the dominoes that have first fallen too, though. It's a nice little review there. And the years are even there to help you out. Sandra, JFK wants to stop who?
Yeah, JFK wants to stop Nodin DM because Nodin DM is terrible and he's not helping the U.S. stop communism. So we actually get Nodin DM assassinated uh, so that we can, in our minds, better support South Vietnam. Dope. Now, I'll give you another 10 seconds to get any comments, questions, or ideas in. I'm going to encourage you guys to keep dropping comments or things in the chat section only because it helps you remember things uh, when you have to uh, write it down. Kevin, you still look great. I like that chair. All right. Uh, and then it asks, what does the U.S. support to Noden DM show about the goals of the Cold War? Uh, it, sh it goes... It's a phenomenal question. Uh, and the U.S. supporting no din diem shows that we don't care who you are. We'll support you if you're not communist. Right? I think if we go back to the first thing you guys read in JFK's inaugural address, which I'll go back to right now, when he says, let every nation know whether you wish us well or ill, that we're going to do anything we can to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Now, of course, that is the U.S.'s version of liberty. So that means the U.S. doesn't care who you are. If you're fighting communism, we got your back. Does that help? Cool. Cool. Y'all the best. I'm actually having a lot of fun with this. We should do this more often. Cool. So good cartoon. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, we see Russia, obviously, as the first domino to fall. Uh, Eastern Europe falls in 1945 we can look at that in terms of the context of the potsdam convention and, and uh stalin at the time refusing to allow free and fair elections in eastern europe for his buffer zone china falls in 49 china falls in 49 under truman's watch north vietnam falls in 54 uh under ho chi minh and the french uh trying to fight to, and failing to keep uh vietnam in their uh uh, sphere of influence and now we're really fighting like hell to keep south vietnam from falling and the concern as you can see is that after south vietnam comes laos after laos comes cambodia after cambodia comes thailand and then the rest of the world what a shame so i have one of i think the best quotes uh that could possibly exist lbj as you guys know from last week is incredibly focused on domestic reform Right? Johnson wants to fix civil rights. Johnson wants to uh, fix poverty. Johnson wants to fix inequality. Johnson wants to fix health care. Johnson wants to fix all these things domestically. He has such big domestic goals, huge domestic goals. Right? But he, he then thinks, well, there's no way I can get my domestic agenda passed if I'm seen as soft on communism. Right. You got to think about the whole context. Right. We're talking about post McCarthyism, second Red Scare, uh, Republicans accusing Democrats of being soft on communism, Truman losing China. So LBJ is, is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place at the beginning of this. He inherits a bad situation. Yes, he makes it entirely worse, but it's important to understand the situation he inherits first. So go ahead and take one minute. It's a great, 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 great quote from Lyndon Bain Johnson and go ahead and read it. Uh, if I left the woman I really loved from there, uh, take a minute and I want, I want to s see some reactions from you guys. What is his point of view? What is his argument about Vietnam uh, in that quote? Take a minute, please uh, jot down some thoughts, throw them in the comment box, and then we will uh, revisit it in about a minute and 20 seconds or so. Go for it. We filled you reading it. Give me some, give me some comments. What is his point of view? What is his <laughs> argument?
Annette, thank you. Sorry, that's the struggle, right? Yeah, Rochelle, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's all those things, but he's also recognizing that if he lets Vietnam fall, then he loses his credibility at home, and then he can't get any of his great society stuff done either. Right, uh, Araceli, I like that. He left a woman for a greater good. The woman he really loves is the great society. He really wants the great society, but he knows. He knows that if he left that war and let the communists take over South Vietnam, he'd be seen as a coward. And his nation would be seen as an appeaser, back to like the echoes of, of Hitler in World War II. Um, and then he, could not, then he couldn't do any good for anybody. So in a sense, uh, Mejia, phenomenal point, phenomenal point. Sandra Guzman, phenomenal point. Really good point, Sandra. I like that. Rochelle, he can't have both. It's either one or the other, but he can't pick. Right? The bitch of a war in Vietnam on the other side of the world. Uh, Daniel, good job. Good job. Good job. Uh, yeah, his priority, guys, his, his big emphasis is domestically. Uh, if we look at LBJ's history uh, in, in the Senate uh, as vice president, his big goal has always been on domestic progress. He's not an expert on foreign policy. That's not his thing. It wasn't his thing in the Senate. It wasn't his thing as vice president. Uh, his main uh, expertise, if you will, is on, on domestic policy. So he kind of makes, I'm not going to call it a mistake, but he keeps on. He keeps on a lot of Kennedy's foreign policy advisors, uh, including Kennedy's brother, uh, Robert Kennedy, as secretary of state. Um, and what we end up doing in Vietnam is we continue this policy that Kennedy had started, uh, and, and by the time the LBJ is really concerned about it, it's too late to change things. So back to the PowerPoint, I go, unless there's any more specific questions. You guys did a really good job, uh, dropping that point of view in on this, the side. I really appreciate it. Nicely done. You guys are, this is a phenomenal, phenomenal practice for college. You guys are doing a really good job. <laughs> Kevin, shut up. I'm muting you. We don't want to hear you coughing. Yeah, so you're muted too. All right. So back to my slides. If I left the woman I really loved, the Great Society, in order to get involved in that bitch of a war on the other side of the world, I would lose everything at home. But if I left that war, then I would be seen as a coward and my nation would be seen as an appeaser. We would both find it impossible to accomplish anything for anybody anywhere in the entire globe. So in a sense, this is LBJ stuck between a rock and a hard place. Now, that's the situation he inherits. That's not his fault. What he does as a president, however, is his fault because he's the president. Um, during 1964, so a year after Kennedy gets assassinated, uh, LBJ has not yet been elected in that landslide election that I showed you guys during the Great Society last week. Uh, and we have what's called the Gulf of Tonkin Affair. Now, it's going to sound very similar to you guys because it's the same way the U.S. has gotten involved in two other wars, uh, the Spanish-American War in 1898 and the Mexican-American War in 1848. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Affair is going to take place in August of 1964. Uh, the U.S. has its navy in the, the, the Gulf of Tonkin in the region in Southeast Asia, uh, and a ship a ship is going to be apparently fired on by North Vietnam, uh, the USS Maddox. Now, we have the benefit of hindsight. Uh, it's very likely that no attack ever took place, uh, but it's very choppy waters and, and the radar and sonar says that maybe there are missiles that were fired at this boat. We panic. Uh, and what LBJ does with it Thank you, Nieto, uh, for your feedback. I appreciate it. Uh, go back to eating your breakfast. Um, what LBJ does with the Gulf of Tonkin uh, is he goes to Congress and says, look, Congress, we have this problem in Vietnam. Uh, the North Vietnamese have attacked our boats. We need the authority to attack them back so that we can look tough on communism. And Congress agrees. And Congress authorizes, it ends up being a huge mistake, what's called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Very, very important. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. I ask you this question, 
How does this demonstrate a shift in foreign policy and power? What this does is it allows LBJ to conduct war on North Vietnam without ever declaring war in North Vietnam. Now, as you guys know, only Congress has the power to declare war. What the Gulf of Tonkin resolution does is it gives Vietnam, excuse me, it gives LBJ basically a blank check on Vietnam. It allows LBJ to defend Vietnam at any cost and allows LBJ the ability to use unlimited military intervention to be used at his discretion. So what it basically does is it takes a pretend attack from North Vietnam on the U.S. on boats that we probably shouldn't have had there in the first place. Uh, and it allows LBJ the ability to defend South Vietnam at any cost and use the military how he sees fit. So I ask you, who did it give additional power and authority to? The president. Uh, it allows, it takes the one, one of the main powers that Congress has over foreign policy, which is the declaration of war, and it says, eh, LBJ, whatever you want. You do what you think is best. So this blank check allows LBJ to escalate the Vietnam War without any real checks or balances on his, uh, on his actions. So it ends up being incredibly important uh, that from this point forward, LBJ's actions on Vietnam are his fault. Uh, I told you he inherited a pretty crappy situation, but what he does with it, uh, we, can, we can place responsibility for. Uh, so I'm going to pause here. Because I have two perspectives on Vietnam that I need for you guys. Oh, who made the resolution? Good question. Good question. Good question. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to answer these three questions before I let you guys uh, read for a minute. Uh, Lupe, uh, the North Vietnamese apparently attacked a U.S. boat. Now, there's no proof or evidence of that attack. Uh, history says it likely didn't happen. And even if it did, it wouldn't have been enough for an entire war to happen because of it. But it's North Vietnamese, the communists attacking a U.S. boat that's patrolling the waters off the coast of Vietnam, much like we blame the Spanish for blowing up the USS Maine in Cuba, much like we blame Mexico for attacking the U.S. soldiers uh, over the Nueces River because of conflicting borders. And who made the resolution in that? The resolution is passed by Congress. So it's Congress basically saying, our power to declare war, we're going to give that to you, President, so you can do with it what you see fit. Now, Daniel, great question. Uh, the, this is a legitimate concern about the growth of the power in the executive branch. Um, unfortunately, Republicans, moderates, Democrats, everybody's so afraid of the spread of communism uh, that, that there's very, very, very few votes in Congress that are against this. Uh, it ends up being almost unanimous uh, as, as almost all the Republicans and Democrats in Congress think it's best that, that we do whatever it takes to contain communism in Vietnam. So what this says is more about uh, criticism of the executive branch, Daniel, and less about that and more about the general contextual fear of the spread of communism. Cool. So I have two texts, uh, LBJ's speech at Johns Hopkins University about uh, Vietnam and what he, the promises that he's making about Vietnam. Uh, and then Eugene McCarthy's address to concerned Democrats uh, about maybe what we shouldn't be doing in Vietnam. So I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to give you four minutes to read them both side by side. You just skim them and tell me what are the different views on Vietnam? What is Johnson's view of Vietnam? And then what is McCarthy's view on Vietnam? Uh, what I'll do here at this point is I'm going to call on a couple of you guys to, sh to turn your mic on and share with us. Uh, or we could just have you guys read them in the, excuse me, uh, respond in the chat function. So go ahead and read through them. I'm going to give you guys four. Uh, and then we will go from there. So four minutes starts right now. Yeah, loops. I'll go back to the side.
that you're reading. What are the two views on Vietnam? What does LBJ have to say about Vietnam? What does McCarthy have to say about Vietnam? I'm reading it with you. We've got about 90 seconds left. about 20 or so seconds. All right. So that's your time. I want to hear what you guys have to say about LBJ's argument as well as McCarthy's argument. Uh, so why don't I call beautiful? Thank you, Cindy. Good, good. Cindy, good point. Johnson is saying that America must fight against communism. We don't have a choice. It's what we have to do. All right, we can't leave Vietnam to its own fate. We fight for values. We fight for principles. We're not fighting for territory or colonies. We're fighting for freedom and democracy and all those fun things. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, thank you. Who else has something to say? Come on, come on. It's your class. Cruzy, thank you. Ah, Freddie, I see you. Sadari, really good point as well, right? That if, if we don't fight for for South Vietnam, then how can anybody else trust us? All right, if we keep if we let them fall, if we leave them alone, then how can we fight anybody else? And Freddie, really good point. Very uh, FDR for freedom-esque. That we're fighting for these high-minded values. We're fighting for all these good things. We're not fighting for territory or control. No, nah, we're fighting because we believe in what we're fighting for. Now I want to hear what you guys have to say about McCarthy. What what what's McCarthy's perspective on uh what what's McCarthy's perspective on the, on the war and war in general? Yeah, 
Good job, Bruce. Uh, Dahlia says that uh, McCarthy argues that war doesn't solve any of these problems, right? Uh, does does McCarthy think the war is in Vietnam specifically? Does McCarthy think the war in Vietnam is justified? Yes or no, and tell me why. I'd like to see that in the comment box. Big perm. McCarthy saying that problems need more attention, so they're just going to war. And this, yeah, he says this war specifically is not constitutionally justified. And we can go back to the Gulf of Tonkin resolution for why, right? And he's saying that uh, only Congress has the power to declare a war, and they have not done so in Vietnam, so therefore we shouldn't be fighting in Vietnam. Reasonable. Good, good, good. Brenda, really good job. All right. uh, also, he says that there's what good is going to come from this? Right, that we're gonna we're gonna spend all this money and and, and spare all the, all these lives are gonna be lost, and yet instead uh, we're gonna fight. What are we fighting for? South Vietnam? Like, what do we really care? Cool. Uh, so I'm gonna jump back into the PowerPoint slide, unless somebody else has something to uh, to either ask or or jump in with. Again, I want to applaud you guys for uh, being phenomenal despite these challenging circumstances. I'm having a good time. Uh, Araceli, phenomenal point, Araceli. That's about as good as I could get for, for one statement. Well, well, well point. <laughs> Rubio, what are you doing here? Uh, Araceli says, LBJ argues that America has to fight in a far place since everybody's on their own, while McCarthy argues that the war in Vietnam won't resolve anything. Good, 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 good. Nicely done, guys. Really, really, really well done. Um, so let's jump back in. At this point, at this point, uh, the U.S. is going to escalate in Vietnam because LBJ, like Kennedy, like Eisenhower, like Truman, doesn't want to lose a specific place or region or locale to communism. So 1965 is a huge turning point year in Vietnam. 65 marks the beginning of full-scale U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Uh, LBJ is told by his advisors, who are the same advisors as Kennedy's advisors, that, in quotes, Without U.S. action, defeat is inevitable. Now, if the U.S. doesn't act, then South Vietnam will fall to communism. Now, to that I ask, if that's the case, then what's the point of the U.S. getting involved? Right? If without the U.S. being there, the whole country is going to be united under communism, then is the U.S. going to get involved for one year? for two years, for 10 years, for 30 years, right? We can kind of compare this in a, not apples to apples comparison, but similar to like FDR and the New Deal, right? When, when we stop spending money in 1937 on things like the Works Progress Administration and the economy crashes, then at what point do we just stop spending money? Likewise here, if, if without the US being involved in, in Vietnam, South Vietnam falls, then are we supporting a doomed cause from the beginning? I think is a good way to put it. Um, we're going to start less with with co with combat soldiers and more with bombing. Uh, LBJ is going to authorize bombing raids into North Vietnam. Uh, it's going to be called Operation Rolling Thunder because it will sound over North Vietnam as if there was constant thunder uh, for the next six to nine months. As we're going to bomb the living crap out of North Vietnam, bridges, factories, infrastructure, etc. Uh, and while we're bombing North Vietnam. LBJ asks for 50,000 U.S. soldiers to be sent to South Vietnam to defend South Vietnam. Now, LBJ never gets in front of the American people uh, to explain how we plan on winning the war in Vietnam. He just says, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and we're going to win the war in Vietnam, and we're doing it because it's the best thing to do, and it's right for Vietnam, and that's that. LBJ's advisors want 100,000 troops in 1965, and they plan for 100,000 more troops in 1966. So we're looking at 200,000 US soldiers in South Vietnam uh, by the following year. Uh, and early on in the war, we're at about 500 US deaths per month. So a lot of people, 500 people obviously is no joke, but in comparison to some of the other wars we fought in the recent years, like World War II, like Korea at the beginning, uh, small casualty cost. So instead of the, the huge 
increase in troops and his advisors wants, LBJ takes it what I consider a middle road, a middle road. So he doesn't go as extreme as his advisors want, but he also doesn't just sit by and let South Vietnam fall. He takes a middle road of limited U.S. intervention, right? He wants to get involved some, but not too much. Not a withdrawal, not a full-scale invasion. We're kind of just there. And that's going to be a good way to look at the Vietnam War for the next six years. We're just there, fighting, dying, but really just there. 65 is this escalation point. Um, I'm going to pause make sure everybody's cool on escalation. Can't see the presentation. Okay. Can you guys see the presentation now? Okay, cool. Then we're good. Thank you, everybody. Y'all the best. So there's a couple things that I want to preface the war uh, with by saying first. The U.S. has a bunch of misguided assumptions. The U.S. makes some assumptions that are not founded in fact and end up being actually incredibly false. First, the U.S. gets involved in Vietnam thinking this will be a quick, easy win. Let's see. We have better technology than the Vietnamese people. We have more people than Vietnam. We have more money than Vietnam. We have more troops than Vietnam. We have more weapons than Vietnam. This will be a quick, easy win. It's going to be awesome. Quick, easy win. If we defeated nazi germany and totalitarian japan uh in two wars in two oceans at the same time why can't we beat this little tiny peninsula of vietnam what's the big deal but that's a misguided assumption because uh the entire the entirety of the vietnam war is going to be fought in jungle terrain uh we we underestimate the determination of the enemy uh in that they are fighting for their independence they are fighting for their freedom uh, and the North Vietnamese are going to use guerrilla tactics, uh, which are going to turn the war into a stalemate. Uh, very much like what the Americans do to the British in the American Revolution, uh, in which the Americans defeat a country that thinks it's going to be a quick, easy war because they have more money and more people and better technology. The Vietnamese are going to resort to hit and run tactics, right? ambushing the U.S. military uh, on their terms and then slipping back into the jungle. Uh, and using their knowledge of the jungle and tunnels and booby traps and all kinds of things to really, really, really frustrate the United States troops. Also, in Vietnam, it ends up being increasingly difficult to figure out who's the enemy and who's just in Vietnam. Uh, the, the forces that we're fighting against are not in uniforms necessarily. They're not uh, in formalized armies. They're indistinguishable from the civilian population. Uh, and they're able to move in and out of the villages throughout Vietnam uh, really undetected, really undetected. It becomes nearly impossible for the U.S. forces to tell between friend or foe. And what happens then in as, this, as this goes on is this is incredibly psychologically damaging for the U.S. forces. So if you think about it, if you don't know who, is, who you're fighting against, you end up thinking you're fighting against everybody. And this leads to a ton of atrocities, some of which you guys read about that are that's due today, the My Lai Massacre. Uh, the U.S. burning villages and taking some drastic steps in this philosophy that everybody's the enemy because the enemy is everywhere. Uh, the U.S. does not understand the type of war that it is fighting. The U.S. thinks this is strictly in terms, the U.S. looks at this strictly in terms of military terms, uh, and the U.S. is thinking that if we kill enough Vietnamese people, they'll give up. Uh, the U.S. looks at this as a body count war. Uh, if we kill 100 people, 200 people, 300 people, 1,000 people, a million people, eventually we'll reach a critical mass number in which the Vietnamese can no longer replenish their troops, their forces, and then they'll give up. Uh, so the U.S. thinks this is a body count war. Right? Every night on the news, the U.S. Is, is, is telling the American people that we're winning the war. Today's fighting in Vietnam had 12 U.S. casualties and 1,400 Vietnamese casualties. Well, that tells Americans that we're winning the war because we're killing way more of them than they're killing of us. However, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, the Vietnamese communists, they're fighting for their very existence. They're fighting to have an independent country. They're fighting an ideological war, whereas the U.S. is simply fighting a military war in the broader context of the Cold War. The Vietnamese are fighting for their very existence, and they're willing to pay any price uh, and fight forever until the U.S. simply just goes away. So the consequence of these assumptions is that the U.S. thinks the war is going to be easy and quick. It is neither. Uh, the U.S. thinks they can win this war by simply killing a lot of Vietnamese people. They cannot. Uh, and the war ends up being 
long, drawn out, bloody, and as the war goes on, incredibly and increasingly unpopular. Guys, my coffee's almost gone. This is sad. It's not good. It's not good. Now, one of the problems of Vietnam uh, ends up being the draft. Uh, as you guys know, there is drafts during... What is this song argument? What is the perspective or point of view or purpose of this song in particular uh, as a means to protest the Vietnam War? What, is, what about the Vietnam War is this particular song protesting? Go ahead and give me a couple responses in the chat, please, if you could. Uh, Nanette thinks that Montes used to play this. That's adorable. Uh, Montes does everything that I do, so it shouldn't surprise us. It's a good song, though. We'll get to a better one in a minute. It did. Evo, I agree. It's a good song. Hey, Davey. Thank you, Mario. I agree. Keep getting removed. Well, I don't know. another 30 or 45 seconds of a couple of you could just drop in what you think this the, the argument or the point of view of this song is that would be excellent good job sandra good job at that line uh some folks inherit star spangled eyes good line Anya, dig a little deeper. Uh, is it just about the fact that it doesn't benefit them or is there more to it than just that? But good point. I need some more. I need some more. Sandra, good job. Brenda, I agree. I agree. All right. Oh, good. Good job, Rochelle. Very good point, Montan. Good, good. Good job, Montan. Good, 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 good. I like it. Yeah. People are becoming, if, you, if we think about this from the, the bigger picture, people are becoming disillusioned with the idea of the Cold War, right? They're, all right. Whoever keeps removing people, cut it out. Leave Stansbury alone. I can't turn that setting off. There's people in here that aren't in a push. I'll kick you out if I need to. Just freaking pay attention. So this song, uh, Sandra, good point. This song is is important because it demonstrates the growing disillusionment or feelings of frustration that is the cold war really even worth it what are we really fighting for what do we care what vietnam does uh communism is, is becoming a little bit less scary um so therefore is it really worth paying any price as kennedy says bearing any burden as kennedy says uh to stop communism anywhere or are we better off just kind of letting the world do its own thing so back to vietnam Back to Vietnam, uh, I'll pop back into my PowerPoint. Um, 
Venom creates this divide between what's called hawks and doves. Hawks and doves. Hawks are the ones asking for more war, more escalation, more violence. And doves, of course, are, are commonly used as a symbol of peace. Um, there's an example of a hawk, General Curtis LeMay, who's one of the leaders in Vietnam, who says, my solution to the problem would be to tell the North Vietnamese communists, frankly, they've got to draw on their horns and stop their aggression, or we're going to bomb them into the Stone Age. And we would shove them back into the Stone Age with air power or naval power, not with ground forces. So some in government, some in the military are considered hawks because they're asking for escalation. We need more, more troops, more bombs, more violence. That will solve the problem. Um, here on the top, let's demand victory in Vietnam. These movements that are, are in, of course, there it is, in God we trust. Uh, this connection between the evangelical right wing and the military, which is interesting. Uh, these, these movements that are, are having demonstrations that are like counter demonstrations that are against the peace movement. Uh, the hawks are asking for more bombs, more anger, more aggression. Uh, now, a couple people in the in the in the Dove camp are important. Uh, first is a group that you guys read about that I mentioned in class last week: the Students for a Democratic Society, the SDS. Super important organization for the 1960s. It's young college students uh, begin. The movement really begins at UC Berkeley uh, and spreads across the country. The Students for a Democratic Society become really the, the figure, the, the leading group organization uh, for the new left, this group of liberals, of young college educated kids who are at When you're muted. <coughs> Back. Let's see. How long was I muted for? About 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Oh, okay, how long? That's because one of you decided to mute me, which is cool. Appreciate it. All right. Cool. Uh, so we talked about the SDS. I think that was pretty clear. Uh, if not, let me know. Just speak up. And uh, MLK has a pretty important pivot uh, after successfully accomplishing the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voter Rights Act of 65. He's going to get pretty involved in anti-Vietnam demonstrations as well. Uh, because as he argues, uh, black people are over fighting for freedom in Vietnam and don't even have freedom uh, at home. Uh, Muhammad Ali, very famous boxer, uh, arguably the biggest uh, sports star in the U.S. at the time, uh, is going to be drafted and refused to go. Uh, he says personally, he says, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. I don't have a problem with those people. Like, why should I go fight them? Uh, he has to actually uh, forfeit his heavyweight boxing championship. Uh, in his in his movement, in his protest. Uh, and we see a whole bunch of clashes between these two sides, the hawks and the doves, regarding Vietnam, uh, as this growing counterculture is going to be spurred on uh, by anti-war. So we look at like the, the conformist culture of the 1950s and then the counterculture of the 1960s, much of which fuels this counterculture is anti-Vietnam sentiment. So as the war escalates, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult for the U.S. to tell the difference between friend and foe. Uh, soldiers, U.S. soldiers are ambushed by people who come, attack soldiers, and just blend right back into the civilian population, uh, leading to the U.S. forces becoming increasingly distrustful of all Vietnamese people because their argument is if it's Vietnamese, it's an enemy. Uh, this distrust occasionally develops into outward hostility, and the U.S. is going to start escalating its actions in a way that you could make an argument is incredibly immoral. Um, the U.S. is going to say that the reason we can't win this war is because of the jungle. We can't see them. If we can't see them, we can't fight them. Uh, so the U.S. is going to, in a sense, uh, declare war on the jungle um, using two things that are incredibly important in the Vietnam War. First is napalm. Uh, 
which is a jelly-like gasoline bomb uh, that is dropped. It's incredibly uh, flammable and explosive. It's basically uh, gasoline, which as you guys know, lights on fire very quickly, um, but in jelly form, which is gonna set fire to jungle areas. Uh, this is an example on the top picture here of a napalm strike on a Vietnam controlled village, Viet Cong controlled village. Uh, and the US is also gonna start dropping Agent Orange, which is actually a leaf killing chemical, a leaf killing chemical that's used to defoliate the jungles. The argument being, if we can get rid of the jungle, then they can't hide. If they can't hide, then we'll win the war. Now, unfortunately, um, this almost always is going to, uh, almost always going to uh, damage villages in Vietnam. Uh, and who, what's going to do? It's going to turn the civilian population in Vietnam against the United States. Right. Uh, most people in Vietnam don't have a preference. Right. They're they're just trying to mind their own business and do their thing. But as the U.S. gets increasingly aggressive, it's going to actually backfire on the U.S. as more and more villages in South Vietnam are going to be like, "Well, those guys are bad because they're here bombing our villages and killing our forests. So we should go side with the other the other side." Uh, this picture at the bottom is very famous as well, as all these children are running away from a a village in which. Uh, napalm uh, has been dropped. We see kids that are burned and naked trying to escape from uh, U.S. attacks. So 1968 hits. Uh, with Lupe, yes, I said that SDS begins in Berkeley. Uh, 1968 begins, and 1968 ends up being a huge turning point uh, in all things United States history. It's a huge turning point in Vietnam. It's a huge turning point in uh, politics. It's a huge turning point in the civil rights movement. It's a huge turning right turning point in the in the protest movements in general. Um, as you guys know, LBJ is elected in 1964 with a landslide election. He wins every state but four against Barry Goldwater, who only wins excuse me five states: Arizona and the four deep south states. LBJ has all this public momentum in 64, and he uses that momentum well. He uses it to get the Civil Rights Act passed, the vote student as before the election, the Voting Rights Act passed. Medicare passed, Medicaid passed, um, uh, education reform passed, war on poverty programs passed. By 1968, however, um, he's going to be increasingly unpopular, largely because of Vietnam. Now, the war begins, excuse me, the year begins uh, with General uh, William Westmoreland, who's in charge of the war in Vietnam, promising to the American people on TV, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There's light at the end of the tunnel. And what that means is that we're almost there. We're getting there. We're going to be okay. We're almost through the dark part. We're getting towards that light. We're being promised by the American military leaders that war is on it. Excuse me, that, that, that victory is on its way. That uh, West Portland is going to continue to say that uh, we've killed so many Vietnamese people that they can only keep resisting for so long. It's only a matter of time. We're almost there. Uh, and what changes everything in America is actually called the Tet Offensive. Uh, after being told for months and months and months the Vietnamese were on their last legs, they're almost ready to quit, uh, the Decong instead launched the Tet Offensive. Uh, it's during the Vietnamese holiday of Tet, which is why it's called the Tet Offensive, against U.S. forces in South Vietnam. Now, this attack is a coordinated attack in 28 cities across South Vietnam that happens on the same day at the same time by North Vietnamese forces. Now, this attack shows that no, North Vietnam is not on their last legs. No, North Vietnam is not about to give up. No, North Vietnam's not giving up anytime soon. Uh, this attack runs contrary or against all the media reports that have consistently been saying since day one that the US is winning the Vietnam War. All right, we, the, the American people keep getting told we're winning, we're winning, we're winning, they're almost done, they're almost out, they're almost giving up, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. And then with one month of fighting in 1968, this narrative is blown up, much like much of Vietnam. Uh, this attack uh, leads LBJ to believe that the Vietnam War actually cannot be won. If we've been uh, increasing our body count uh, for, against North Vietnam so much and they still have this much uh, motivation, this much manpower, this much influence. Uh, and it is after the Tet Offensive that LBJ basically just says, I'm done. 
Uh, he says, I'm going to seek a truce with the Vietnamese. If you blame me for losing Vietnam, oh well, but I'm going to spend the last five months of my presidency negotiating a peace, and I'm not going to seek re-election. I'm out. I'm done. That's it. So the Tet Offensive uh, really changes millions of Americans' minds about Vietnam in a matter of weeks. Um, it's going to have a cause a huge increase in the uh, Dove percentage. Um, the people that claim to be a, a hawk or pro-aggressive Vietnam policy is going to go from 56% to 40% in just a few weeks, which is a crazy drop in public opinion. Uh, the percentage of the population that argues that they are doves, they're pro-peace, is going to go from 28 to 40% in just a few weeks. So we're seeing a huge decline in support for the war and a huge increase in peace. Uh, and even the mainstream journalists um, who've been covering the war since the beginning are going to openly criticize and question what the what the U.S. is doing uh, in the Vietnam War. Uh, arguably, the most important, most influential journalist at the time, who's on ABC News every night, is named Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, um, and he gets on the news and says, "It looks more and more like the U.S. is going to lose this war, and the very best, this war is going to end in a tie in a stalemate," uh, which causes President LBJ to say, in quotes. If I've lost Cronkite, then I've lost the American people. So the Tet Offensive ends up being incredibly influential in swaying public opinion and changing LBJ's perspective. It changes the way the media covers the war as well, uh, which is why it's such a significant turning point for the war. Now, the Tet Offensive is actually a failure for the North Vietnamese militarily. Uh, their goal was to go come to South Vietnam and start a revolution of the South Vietnamese people. Uh, that does not happen. The U.S. military actually ends up winning, uh, eventually pushes back the Tet Offensive, but the damage is done uh, in terms of public opinion. I've told you guys really since day one that you can't win a war without public support, any kind of war. Right? There's a reason the civil rights movement, right, as a social war, uses TV and the media to sway public opinion. In this case, the U.S. military is increasingly losing public support, and you cannot win a war without public support. Here's a very, I'm sorry, this picture is a little blurry, but it's a very famous picture of LBJ just anguished over what to do about the Tet Offensive. Uh, it is shortly after this picture is taken that he gets on TV and says, and I quote, I will not seek, nor will I accept the Democratic nomination for the presidency in 1968. Basically, he's eligible to run for a second term since he's only, uh, he only serves the one year of Kennedy's term and then his term he's elected for. He's eligible to run for a second term, but Vietnam has ruined him and his presidency. It's aged him incredibly. Uh, and he says, basically, uh, screw this, I am out. So this I'm out. So a couple of pictures that kind of demonstrate the tragedy uh, of, of Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is the first war that's largely fought with helicopters uh, to transport men. Again, an example of technological advances. Uh, here in the bottom left corner, I have a picture of a U.S. gunboat. There's our flag kind of indiscriminately firing on, on villages, uh, demonstrating in this war about how the civilian and military population are really murky, they're hard to, to tell the line. Uh, this is an incredibly famous picture in the top right corner uh, of a, a village of children being burned out, uh, naked children uh, with their skin burned by napalm. Uh, and in the bottom right corner is a picture that takes place in the context of the Tet Offensive. Um, this is the leader of South Vietnam, South Vietnam's military police uh, firing on a, a, a suspected spy during the Tet Offensive. Uh, this, the video footage of this you'll see in the documentary that I linked for Thursday is that absolutely chilling uh, as on the U.S. public sees on TV uh, this man being shot in the head uh, by a commander of the South Vietnamese. Again, really just damaging public opinion for the like. Uh, here's a picture of a village being burned out by U.S. troops. Uh, and then, of course, as you guys read about, uh, the My Lai Massacre. As U.S., this is just one example, the most glaring example, of U.S. military uh, troops uh, going into a village and uh, attacking all those uh, men, women, and children uh, who live in it. Uh, and these images end up being plastered all over the U.S. news and causing a ton of damage as well. The response to this, I'm going to open up questions in a second because there's a lot of talk. The response to this is a huge increase 
uh, in the counterculture anti-war movement, as here we see uh, soldiers trying to maintain the peace and hippies just putting flowers in their guns. Uh, it's a perfect picture of the juxtaposition between um, the U.S. government and the peace movement uh, that's urging the U.S. government to stand down in Vietnam. After Tet, the protests increase significantly. Uh, I like this sign because it gets right to the point. Get the hell out of Vietnam. Uh, I don't give a damn for Uncle Sam. I ain't going to Vietnam. Not bad. Not bad. Uh, and then I will pause right there for questions. So go ahead and take a minute and get yourself caught up. Um, I want you to take a minute, if there's any questions about the TED Offensive, questions about the US response to it, any of these atrocities, uh, I'll give you guys about 30 seconds or 45 seconds um, to ask and clarify any questions that you have here. Uh, and then I'll get started with uh, how the, the war impacts the great society and things at home. Yes, Daniel. Questions? Comments, concerns? Um, no, Rochelle, the US is not winning in the Vietnam War by any accounts, except the US's own account that we're winning because we're killing more people than we're having killed. Uh, it goes back to one of those, those misguided assumptions from earlier uh, in that the US thinks that they can kill enough Vietnamese people, then the Vietnamese will give up. Uh, but the US is fighting a traditional war of like people where the Vietnamese are just like, we're gonna fight you and then leave and then fight you and then leave and then we're gonna fight long enough until you just give up. Uh, Anya, great question. Uh, it has a, a huge, uh, it has a huge impact on uh, American society. Trust, people stop trusting the government as much because the government it appears has been lying to them. Um, it has a huge impact on the US economy as a ton of inflation from uh, the cost of the war. Uh, Daniel, I'll be done in like, maybe 10 or 15. Uh, and yes, Ruti, the My Lai massacre is a huge negative impact on public opinion uh, as the US is going to uh, not do good things uh, in Vietnam. Uh, what time does your physics lecture start? Total here to mind his own business. Just kidding, love that guy. All right, so let's get into the way it, this, uh, to continue on Anya's question, other impacts on society as a whole. All right. I'm gonna start again in 20 seconds.
Uh, I messaged Rivera about Go Guardian, so we can go from there. All right. So uh, I was asked how much how much was the domestic response? They changed in America. Let's talk about the domestic response. So the the war actually is going to kill the U.S.'s economic prosperity that we'd had from the 1950s and early 1960s. So that as the U.S. involvement in Vietnam increases, the nation's economy begins to suffer. Uh, inflation is going to increase uh, by double by 1960, more, almost triple from 2% to 5.5%. So goods are becoming increasingly expensive because we're spending so much money on Vietnam and the Great Society that costs are, are key and huge. Um, President Johnson has to increase taxes uh, to pay for his Great Society programs. Uh, President Johnson has to have this tax increase and also then cut a bunch of money from Great Society programs. Um, this is going to cause the American people to question why we're we paying more taxes to pay for this war. Uh, by 1967, the U.S. has dropped more bombs on just Vietnam uh, than in the entire World War II all combined. The U.S. has close to a half a million troops on the ground in Vietnam, and the U.S. by 1967 is spending two billion dollars a month on the war. So when you guys ask, like, what the impact is in U.S. society, it's going to wreck the U.S. economy. It's going to uh, decrease the spending for great society programs that you wanted so much, uh, and we're still losing. Uh, Vietnam also has a huge impact on society because it's the first war in which TV has a big impact. TV does us a whole bunch of good during the civil rights movement, but that same TV that we can, wa we can watch the civil rights movement taking place on, people are watching the same footage every night from Vietnam as well. Uh, combat footage appears in millions of homes nightly, and Vietnam becomes known as the Living Room War. Now this cartoon uh, is one of my favorites of the time period. Take a minute, please, maybe two. Uh, I want you to talk about what's the purpose and the point of view of this cartoon uh, in relaying the impacts of Vietnam. It's a good cartoon, I think you guys will appreciate it. Uh, but take two uh, and figure out, if you could, uh, what what this cartoon's arguing about Vietnam, the Great Society, and LBJ in general. This, at the bottom left corner, uh, that's uh, President LBJ, okay? Uh, Daniel, no, it's not the first instance that we see opposition to a war in America. We see a ton of opposition in World War I, hence Espionage and Sedition Acts. We see a ton of opposition to the Civil War, the New York City draft riots and the like. Um, and yeah, Multan, I'm going to post this on YouTube. And we'll be done. We'll be done pretty soon. Good job, Sarai. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Dive into this cartoon, The Train Robbery. It's a good one. Need a couple more people. What is the purpose of this cartoon? The point of view of this cartoon? What is this cartoon getting at regarding the Great Society? All right, anybody else on the cartoon? Responses, thoughts, perspectives? It's not just about sacrificing the Great Society, but also what's the impact on the economy. All right. So let's get into uh, 
what then results in society. I should be back on my PowerPoint. Now, yes, Daniel, absolutely. This is absolutely the end of post-World War II prosperity in the economy. That because of the combination of, of great society spending and the Vietnam War, huge increase in inflation to pay for the war to increase taxes and that together is going to cause that post-war prosperity to crumble and when people are pissed off then that then hurts the uh the economy even even more so all right so let's dive into the the conclusion here uh the protest movement's going to evolve significantly we're going to see a huge amount of self-immolation is this extreme form of protest uh here on the right hand side we have a Buddhist monk, Thik Quan Duc, uh, who is burning himself uh, in protest of the Vietnam War. Uh, we see all these hippies uh, and the counterculture and the protest movement arguing for love, not war. Uh, here in the bottom left corner, we see what's called the Progressive Youth Movement, uh, which is an outcropping of the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, who was there uh, protesting right on the steps outside the White House. Uh, celebrities like Jane Fonda, here she is in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, Jane Fonda is going to speak to Vietnam vets at an anti war rally. Uh, and even John Kerry, who later runs for president, uh, is, is a Vietnam veteran who becomes very anti Vietnam War as well. So this protest movement evolves very quickly. Um, some of the elements of it uh, become the counter culture movement, uh, or the hippies, or the flow flower children. Uh, who are going to argue for nonviolent anarchism? They're going to argue that our government uh, is is fraudulent in what it does uh, in support of war around the world, uh, and nonviolence is the way. These are the Michael Bushes of the world. Uh, the hippies, this movement in the 1960s, are going to reject materialism. So in that way, they're going to be kind of the continuation of from the 1950s, the Beatniks or the Beat movement, which you could argue is a continuation of the transcendentalists from the 1840s and 50s. Uh, and the hippies would be very concerned for the environment, that we're, gonna, we're, we're ruining the environment uh, and we should be doing more to help that. Um, an outcropping of the hippies are the Yippies, the Youth International Party. Same idea of just they're the counterculture, they're against the conformity of the 50s and early 60s. They're much more radical with theatrical protests and tactics. Um, but all of this is going to uh, lead to what we consider a sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. Um, as the uh, U.S. society is going to have more access to contraception, we're going to be engaging in much more premarital sex. Um, Playboy is going to come out uh, and kind of revolutionize the, the way in which uh, Americans look at sexuality. Uh, abortion is going to become legal uh, via the Supreme Court case Roe v. Wade in 1973. But we talked in the 50s about how women and men both go into their, their predetermined gender roles in the 60s that box is going to break that box is going to break so the conformity of the 50s is kind of going to blow up to a lot of craziness in the 60s i tell you guys often in class that politically we often go back and forth from like liberal conservative we often do the same thing socially and culturally as well so this conformity of the 50s of everybody fitting in these nice neat little boxes is going to lead to an explosion of counterculture and sexuality and challenging gender roles in the 60s and the 70s now, this counterculture is defined by a couple groups, the hippies, of course, uh, but also this new left, the Students for a Democratic Society. The SDS is monumentally important to what's happening in the 1960s. Uh, the SDS is going to put out what's called the Port Huron Statement. It's a very important document. College Board loves this document, so I'd be familiar with what it is and how it's associated with the new left and the SDS if I were you. Um, and it says, we are people of this generation bred in at least modest comfort. I Meaning we were raised in comfortable standings, right? Out of the 1950s prosperity. We're housed now in universities and we're looking uncomfortably to the world we inherit. Um, it's this uncomfortability with the world around them. It's gonna cause them to question the Cold War and question uh, poverty and question uh, civil rights and question equality and all these things. Uh, the goals of the SDS and this new left uh, are a much more participatory democracy. So they're going to be arguing for more participation, more democracy, more rights, more freedom. They're going to be very, very, very pro-civil rights. And despite the fact that many of them are young white college students, they're going to be very anti-white supremacy. Uh, they're going to be anti-establishment, anti, anti what our government's doing, anti-imperial war, which is what they see the Cold War as. Uh, and another worthwhile movement to know of them is uh, the movement that's called the Weathermen or the Weather Underground. 
which is a violent, aggressive, radical faction of the SDS, which engages in some bombings in the 70s uh, and the like as well. Uh, so this counterculture, this counterculture uh, is going to be defined in a couple places. First is UC Berkeley. Berkeley really is where a lot of this begins. Um, uh, this, this picture at the top right corner is a very famous picture of a protest at the University of California at Berkeley at their gate. Um, UC Berkeley is going to have the free speech movement beginning in the 60s uh, that's going to really begin questioning the Vietnam War. Uh, and then Columbia University as well uh, in New York City is going to be very anti-government uh, and Vietnam War as well for very similar reasons. Cool. Cool. Uh, the counterculture lifestyle is going to be defined by uh, drugs and sex, uh, a huge increase in the use of marijuana, and that escalates to the use of LSD, uh, which is a hallucinogenic drug. Uh, the sexual revolution of the counterculture as well is going to challenge mainstream society's morals on sexuality and relationships. Uh, we see the normalization in the 60s of contraception, the normalization of birth control, the normalization of homosexuality, uh, and the normalization of abortion as well. Uh, in terms of acceptable things to do within the counterculture. Uh, now, a lot of this also is we end up seeing through music uh, as part of the culture. A lot of the music in the 60s becomes very famous. Bob Dylan, Jim Morrison, the Rolling Stones, eventually even the Beatles evolve into a much more of a protest music type of expression. Jimi Hendrix. Uh, all the music is going to be using the ideas of anti-establishment, anti-conformity, anti-traditionalism, anti-war, anti-consumerism. Uh, so a lot of these themes of questioning authority, but doing so through music, really defines the counterculture of the 1960s that comes out of the Vietnam War. Uh, Woodstock is a very famous uh, three-day rock concert, like the original uh, Coachella, if you will. Uh, 500,000 people attend this outdoor rock festival uh, in which very, very famous bands um, uh, perform, and it's a huge, um, a lot of the elements of Woodstock are anti-Vietnam as war. But I told you earlier, the 1968, as we get to our very last page, check us out. 1968 is considered in American history the year of rage, the year of anger. The year of rage. I have some questions that I can stop here for a second. <laughs> I want to stop and check up on these questions real quick. Good, 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 good. Uh, Daniel asked, why was there so much successful opposition to the war? Did martial law not apply? No, there's no martial. We don't ever declare war in Vietnam, so the martial law doesn't apply. Uh, anti-establishment in net just uh, uh, refers to like anti-conformity, anti-mainstream society. Right, the establishment is just like what what everyday Americans want us to do, so they're going to do the opposite. Good question. Good question. Uh, do, cool. We're all muted again. Good. 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 All right, so 68, I'll let you guys get caught up for a second. 68 is a monumentally important year because all these bad things happened in 1968. Uh, 68 starts with the Tet Offensive, uh, which of course makes Americans incredibly angry, uh, makes LBJ incredibly frustrated, and shows the world that the US is not winning the war in Vietnam. It is, it is the Tet Offensive that causes LBJ to not seek re-election as president. Uh, and it only gets worse from there. Um, a key leader of South Vietnam is assassinated um, a, a day later after the Tet Offensive. Uh, in March, we see the My Lai Massacre, which as you guys read about, uh, just again, just damages exponentially the US credibility in Vietnam as, as the soldiers are then accused of doing things like killing and, and, and women and children. Uh, by the end of March of 1968, LBJ withdraws from the presidential election saying, I'm not going to run for re-election and makes that official in March. We're only three months into the year and all this has already happened. Four days later, MLK is assassinated. Uh, once MLK is assassinated, we see a huge amount of racial protests in places like Memphis where he's assassinated, uh, LA, Detroit, Chicago as well. MLK is assassinated. Uh, the very famous Columbia uh, University protests uh, that are part of that SDS movement against the war take place that same month. Uh, running for president as a Democrat is Robert Kennedy, uh, who is incredibly liberal. He's anti-war and pro-civil rights. Uh, and he's the Democratic front runner to, to replace LBJ in 1968. 
he's running for president. He gets assassinated in June, just here in Los Angeles. Uh, so everything is falling apart and we're only six months into the year. Uh, the Democratic National Convention convenes like they do to decide who their nominee is going to be to uh, to run for president uh, for the Democrats since LBJ is not doing it. And there's riots uh, as Eugene McCarthy. And, and it's it's a hot mess of of different factions of the Democratic Party, the factions that want to end Vietnam, the factions that want to escalate in Vietnam, the factions that want to continue great society programs. So there's huge riots, uh, as you see at the bottom right hand corner, as Democrats are just trying to pick their next presidential candidate. And can't even do so without riots uh and all of this anger uh racial anger vietnam social anger, economic anger, is all going to lead to uh nixon nixon as as a republican supposed to be a stability figure winning election on November 5th. So 68 is a hot mess. So it shouldn't surprise us that Americans switch from Democrats to Republicans, because that's usually what happens with this chaos and turmoil. So Republicans capitalize on all this chaos to, to win the election in 1968 on a couple things. Uh, this is what becomes known as the Republican Southern strategy. I want to emphasize this because it carries through to today. Now Republicans, are going to argue that the national government's gotten too big and too powerful. The national government through things like civil rights and the great society. Who keeps removing people? All right. Honestly, honestly, guys, like who's removing people? People are trying to learn here. Can we just mind our own business and learn? Andy, why are you fed up? It's not even your class. Daniel, you ask about uh, youth in the counterculture. It's largely young people, but it's my youth. Youth can be minorities. It's it's mostly white young people in the counterculture, but black as well. All right, good questions. Let me wrap up with Nixon and Vietnam. Uh, Republicans are going to use what's called the Southern strategy, which means they're going to argue for states' rights. Now, I want to emphasize this, that in what other context has the use of states' rights been used to argue for something? And that's usually been uh, states' rights as a justification for slavery and then states' rights as a justification for not extending civil rights to African Americans. Um, what this other strategy does uh, in the state's rights argument is it's going to split working class white people away from working class black people. Now, up to this point, up to this point, working class white people have almost always voted Democrat. Back to the days of Jackson and Martin Van Buren and the northern industrial working class voters, uh, working class white voters uh, voted for Democrats through the New Deal, through the Progressive Era, through World War II. With Nixon's Southern strategy and this argument that the federal government's doing more to protect minorities than white people, working class whites are going to leave the Democratic Party and vote Republican instead. Uh, this is what's going to lead the, the new South, the solid South, to be voting Republican instead. Uh, it's going to lead us to a lot of what we see today in uh, political dynamics. So this is what 1968 looks like. Take a look. I'll give you a minute. Uh, to take a look at it, Republicans uh, with Nixon are going to win a good chunk of the country. Uh, and he promises a return in his mind to law and order. Um, kind of like a return to normalcy argument. Kind of like a return to normalcy argument. Um, and, and this Southern strategy of getting Southerners to not vote Democrat because Democrats are the party of civil rights and progress. Democrats nominate Hubert Humphrey in 1968 uh, after their national convention leads to riots. And our friend George Wallace is running for president again uh, as an American independent, arguing again for segregation. Uh, and you can see he wins a good chunk of states in 1968, uh, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and uh, Arkansas. Uh, so pretty important election. Nixon wins on this idea of law and order and bringing stability back to society. 
Um, I'm not going to spend any time on his domestic policy today. That's for next week. But I will talk about his policies on Vietnam before we wrap up. So Nixon on Vietnam. Yeah, Guzman, I see you. Cruz, I agree. Wallace sucks. Segregation forever. Um, Nixon on Vietnam. Nixon, when he runs for president, he promises uh, this beautiful promise. It's called peace with honor, meaning that we're going to walk away from Vietnam, but we're going to walk away from Vietnam on our terms. We're going to get peace, but we're going to get peace our way so we still don't lose our pride. Uh, now, his appeal is to what he calls his silent majority. I want to stress this point, uh, silent majority, uh, meaning we're not the ones who are out in the streets protesting for change, but we still maintain the majority of America. So the opposite of silent is loud. The opposite of majority is minority. So in, in Nixon saying that I stand for the silent majority, he's basically calling all the people that are protesting that are loud in the streets, the loud minority important that we look at that, that juxtaposition there. Um, his, his war asks for Vietnamization, meaning we'll still support South Vietnam, but it better be them that's fighting their war, not us fighting their war for them. Uh, but actually, behind the scenes, he's going to expand the conflict. He's going to begin bombing Laos and Cambodia, uh, the two countries that border South Vietnam, uh, in an attempt to disrupt the supply lines to, to, to fight the war in Vietnam, gets involved in Cambodia, gets involved in Laos. And it's Nixon that significantly increases the use of Agent Orange defoliating uh, the forests of South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. There's a picture of a plane there dropping it all on South Vietnam. So Nixon promises to, to lessen the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. And then what Nixon does instead is he takes the U.S. Army and invades Cambodia and invades Laos. He actually expands the war in Vietnam after promising to reduce the U.S. impact. Now, uh, the U.S. invades Cambodia. It's supposed to be secret. It becomes well known. And that's only going to increase the protest, increase the anger, increase the frustration of the young people in America who, uh, for much of their adult lives, the U.S. has been fighting in Vietnam. Uh, after the U.S. invades Cambodia secretly, um, and then it comes out, uh, college students are going to hold a series of really, really, really big, strong protests around the country that are going to end poorly. Um, the two best examples I can give you uh, is Jackson State University, which is a black college in Mississippi. Uh, there's going to be a huge protest. Um, police are going to kill two students and wound nine other students who are simply processing the Vietnam War. Now, unfortunately, it's at a black university, so that doesn't get nearly the attention of what happens in Ohio uh, at Kent State University. Now, at Kent State University, uh, students are gonna burn down the ROTC building, which is basically the, the military recruitment and training building on the college campus. Uh, Ohio governor is gonna call these students worse than Nazis and tries to kick these kids off of campus for protesting the war. And then during a protest on May 4th of 1970, uh, the Ohio National Guard is called in to put down a student protest. Uh, the National Guard opens fire on student demonstrators and kill four students. Now, these kids are on their college campuses exercising free speech and now being killed by their government for protesting the war. Uh, these killings are going to outrage the public. They're going to cause a huge new wave of student strikes and protests around the country. Um, by the end of May, uh, over 400 colleges have canceled all classes, uh, and, and the Nixon administration only makes things worse. Um, the Nixon's press secretary, the guy who's supposed to like speak for the administration states that, uh, student deaths were evidence that when dissent turns to violence, it invites tragedy. Uh, and in the first one and a half years of Nixon's presidency, it looks like our, our domestic situation has just gotten worse. So Kent State is a, is a, Terrible. Yeah, it's nuts. Imagine like protesting, being mad about something and having the U.S. government uh, kill you for it. So that gives us uh, this incredibly famous picture of the Kent State massacres, which I would know if I were you because College Board loves these Kent State massacres of this, this student who was gunned down by the National Guard simply for protesting the war. Uh, very, very, very famous picture. And uh, it leads to... 
go ahead and just give me a couple of things in the chat box if you could. Uh, what is uh, Crosby still <laughs> and Nash saying here about Kent State, about Vietnam as a whole, about Nixon's presidency? What is the argument uh, that is embedded here in Ohio? Go ahead and give me a couple of responses if you could uh, to the song. Anybody, anybody? We're almost done, guys. I need a couple of reactions. Hi, Daniel. All right. So the last thing to speak on is the Pentagon Papers, uh, which is a quite influential piece of, of Nixon's administration as well. Uh, while all this is happening, while all this is happening, a, a former analyst for the Defense Department is going to begin leaking a bunch of documents that are supposed to be top secret to the New York Times. Uh, and all these documents reflect LBJ's lies on Vietnam, Nixon's lies on Vietnam, all of these, these false promises the U.S. government had been making about Vietnam. And he starts sending them to the New York Times. Now, these documents tell the New York Times and then the American people that the government has significantly misled Congress and the American people regarding what was actually happening in Vietnam throughout the mid 1960s. Uh, these documents prove that the primary reason for fighting in Vietnam was not to eliminate communism, but instead to avoid embarrassment. Uh, they proved that as early as 1965, as early as 1965, uh, LBJ and the White House knew that they likely weren't going to win in Vietnam, but they wanted to prolong the war as much as possible to avoid the embarrassment of losing in Vietnam. Uh, the Nixon administration sues the New York Times to keep them from publishing these embarrassing documents, but the Supreme Court rules in 1971 in New York Times versus the U.S. that the New York Times has every right to publish these documents because of the freedom of the press. Now, by 1973, Again, uh, we're promised that peace is at hand, that the war is almost over, uh, and then it's, by, it's Nixon's presidency, obviously, by now. Um, Kissinger, his chief uh, uh, negotiator on Vietnam, says that we're almost done. It's almost done. We're about to find peace. And then just like Tet, North Vietnam attacks the South. Uh, the most massive U.S. bombing responds. Um, and by 1973, the U.S. Is, uh, signs a ceasefire an agreement to stop fighting between the U.S., South Vietnam, and North Vietnam. Uh, it is here that Nixon argues he has achieved his peace with honor, as the U.S. basically, as of 1973, just walks away from Vietnam. The condition of the ceasefire, the U.S. removes all troops. Uh, the North Vietnamese that already have their troops in South Vietnam, they can leave them there. The U.S. basically just walks away and says, South Vietnam, good luck. Uh, North Vietnam resumes the war without us there. Uh, we don't negotiate any provision on prisoners of war or those who are missing in action. And the last American troops are out of South Vietnam on March 29th of 1973. By 1975, North Vietnam has defeated South Vietnam and unified the entire country uh, under communist North Vietnamese rule. And Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, is renamed Ho Chi Minh City. Now, the impacts where we'll end off. Because of the Vietnam War, we see some significant change, which every war gives us. First, the 26th Amendment is ratified, which gives 18-year-olds the right to vote. The argument of all these people protesting the war was you're sending us to fight in a war that we can't even vote on. Uh, the voting age as of the 26th Amendment is dropped to 18. Big deal. Big deal. Uh, Nixon abolishes the draft because the draft is so unpopular due to Vietnam. And ever since, the U.S. has not had a draft since. We had an all-volunteer military. Uh, the War Powers Act, super important, is passed in 1973, which basically overrides the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and makes uh, the president much more accountable to Congress in conducting war. Um, so the president has to notify Congress within 48 hours of sending the military anywhere. 
and must get congressional approval to keep military troops anywhere around the world. Uh, but there's a huge amount of disregard for the veterans of Vietnam. Every veteran group in American history has always been applauded and highlighted. Uh, the veterans in Vietnam are seen are called baby killers and spit on and protested when they come back uh, from the war, which is going to lead to a significant amount of disillusionment from this this generation of veterans from Vietnam. Uh, there's an, a lingering issue of the prisoners of war who were stuck in Vietnam for another six, seven, eight years, and those who were missing in action. Uh, and the costs are incredibly high. Three million Vietnamese people are killed in this conflict. Fifty-eight thousand Americans are killed, and there are three hundred thousand being wounded. Uh, because of the war, financially, we've underfunded all those great, great society programs so that they're not as effective as supposed to be. Uh, and the U.S. spends on Vietnam $150 trillion just for the opportunity to lose the war. Uh, some of you asked earlier about the effects on society. The U.S. morale is decimated. The U.S. trust in their government is decimated because of the war itself and the Pentagon Papers. The U.S. confidence in its ability to conduct foreign policy is decimated. The war is a disaster for U.S. society. I think I'll leave you on is Ho Chi Minh's quote. He says at the beginning of this war, if we have to fight, we will fight. You will kill 10 of our men and we will kill just one of yours. And in the end, it will be you who tires of it. Now, Ho Chi Minh says this in the early 1960s. And I'd argue that by 1973, he's proven incredibly correct. Incredibly correct. Now with that, we have completed our first online lecture. Let's go. I know. So I want to get uh, feedback from you guys on, on what you uh, on our reactions to Vietnam in general, on our all these uh, and then also focus up on YouTube for the few of you who weren't able to make it. Sandra, good point. Nixon allowing the murder of college to play in their freedom of speech. Two. Okay. Brian, I see you. Two. 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 Ai Wei. Wei, thank you. All right, cool. So I will stop this recording now. No. <laughs>